Okay, so we are ready to begin now. And good day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and the audience here or on Facebook or other platforms. We are immensely pleased to have you today with us to discuss a milestone work and a growing consensus in the international community amongst human rights groups and organizations to recognize the reality in the um, land between the river and the sea as a crime of apartheid. And to start with the rules of today's session um, for uh, speakers, each speaker will begin with 15 minutes remarks that we, would be followed by a QA and a um, segment. And when you are not um, speaking, please keep the microphone muted. For the audience, please remember to keep both camera and microphone closed during the discussion until the Q&A session starts. Um, feel free to pose questions by uh, in the chat box here throughout the discussion or in the live feed on Facebook or through the email. We will be check checking those regularly. So to begin, in 2017, we have a report that, that was a bombshell at the time, co-authored by Professor Richard Folk um, under the OESQUA uh, spouses. And back then, the report was withdrawn by the United Nations for not following um, the pretext that was given as not following appropriate procedure. There was a risk of a backlash from the United States when it was the Trump administration and uh, the US ambassador to the UN back then, uh, Ms. Nikki Haley made that clear and obvious. Then we have this year, two more major reports, one that came from Israel's top human rights organization, Bit Salem, uh, co-authored by Haggai Elad, in which they took the position that Israel's um, Israel as it is of today, now looking at the landscape at the moment, it professes a regime of apartheid, of maintaining uh, what the report of B'Tselem quote unquote says, uh, Jewish supremacy between the river and the sea. Then we have another major and unprecedented report coming from Human Rights Watch, co-authored by our guest today here, Omar Shaker in which it argued after a lengthy uh, process of at least two years of deliberations and investigation that Israel is uh, implicated in committing a crime of apartheid and a crime of persecution of the Palestinian people between the river and the Mediterranean Sea. So to begin this discussion, we will go to Mr. Umar Shaker as our first speaker, who is currently uh, the Israel-Palestine Director at Human Rights Watch, where he investigates abuses in Israel or across the occupied territories uh, in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. And the floor is yours, Omar. Please go ahead. Thank you, um, Hamad, and uh, thank you all for joining us, and thank you to Euromed for convening this really uh, interesting panel. And I know so many of us for the past couple of weeks have had um, you know, our eyes glued and our hearts, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, the people facing bombardment, uh, obviously primarily in the Gaza Strip, but also in communities across uh, Israel facing rocket attacks and the bloodshed and carnage, I think, took a toll on so many of us, um, but in some ways makes this conversation so timely. Because, you know, while there is a ceasefire, and I suspect in the days ahead, the interest and attention of the international community will shift away from Israel-Palestine, will shift to other issues. But what it will leave behind is a reality that millions of people on the ground today face. Um, and that reality is many things. And one of the core things is apartheid and persecution for millions of Palestinians. What I'd like to do in my brief uh, you know, remarks, opening remarks, and I look forward to hearing from our other panelists and the conversation is to describe uh, the Human Rights Watch report that was released on April 27th. Uh, explain in brief, it's a 213 page report. So in brief, our findings, how we arrived at them, um, and a little bit about sort of where the conversation is today, a little bit more than a month out and very much look forward to hearing the insights of the, of the remaining panelists. 
So let me start by saying, as Mohammed mentioned, this report was well over two years in the making. Um, Human Rights Watch sought to evaluate Israel's treatment of Palestinians um, in across Israel in the occupied territory. We have been working on human rights issues in Israel and Palestine for well over three decades. Increasingly, discrimination has become a central focus of our work, the discriminatory treatment of Palestinians. You know, over the years, we did reports that looked at the treatment of Palestinians in different areas, in Area C of the West Bank, uh, in East Jerusalem, inside Israel proper. Um, this report really tried to connect the dots. Uh, try to understand, um, you know, at, at a bigger picture level, as well as in more granular detail, how does Israel treat Palestinians? You know, what can we say? When we look at the policy much more holistically. What conclusions can we draw? Um, the report is based on years of Human Rights Watch research, um, as well as new case studies conducted for this report and a review of government planning documents, statements by officials, um, and other sources. Really, for us, the, the question that brought about this research is a sense that all those years of work we had done um, wasn't speaking to the core reality on the ground, a reality in which one government primarily rules over two groups of people living in one territory. Um, those groups are about of equal size. So here I'm talking about the Israeli government ruling over about an equal number of Jewish Israelis and Palestinians living between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea in present-day Israel and the occupied territory, and a reality in which Jewish Israelis, wherever they live, have the same rights and privileges and are methodically privileged, while Palestinians are repressed at varying degrees of intensity, of course, most intensely in the occupied Palestinian territory. So once we documented the facts, we then evaluated them against the established law um, on discrimination. As many folks know, there is a universal prohibition against severe discriminatory oppression or apartheid. While the term was coined in relation to South Africa, it is now a universal legal term incorporated in numerous international treaties, including the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Apartheid is also a crime against humanity, set out not only in its own 1973 convention, which defines the crime and its elements, but also under the 1998 Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court. As a crime against humanity, apartheid is primarily about three things when they take place together. One is an intent by one group of people to dominate another. Second, um, is systematic uh, uh, oppression by the dominant group over the marginalized group. And thirdly, inhumane acts committed um, against the repressed group. So intent to dominate, systematic oppression, inhumane acts. There is the related crime against humanity of persecution, which is set out not only in customary international law, but also in, under the Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court, um, and uh, that crime against humanity is primarily similarly about discriminatory intent when it leads to severe abuses of fundamental rights. So when Human Rights Watch evaluated the facts that we documented, again, I, I, based on this case studies and this years of Human Rights Watch research against these crimes, we reached the conclusion that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. In particular, we found that the elements of the crime come together in the occupied territory, but pursuant to a single government policy. That policy is to maintain the domination of Jewish Israelis over Palestinians across Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. And in the occupied territory, that intent has been combined with inhumane acts and systematic oppression committed against Palestinians living there. So let me sort of take a minute to describe this finding. In more layman's terms, our finding is based on this intent or policy across all areas of Israeli control to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians, and secondarily, um, the, the, the severe abuses in the occupied territory. 
So Human Rights Watch, of course, you know, we, 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 we first, uh, we, we looked at all these policies, but on the intent part of the analysis, we wanted to understand, you know, what motivates Israel's policy towards um, Palestinians. And what we found is that Israeli authorities have sought to maintain Jewish Israeli control over demographics and land across Israel and the occupied territory. Um, it begins with uh, Israeli policies, uh, ado Israeli authorities adopting policies that openly seek to mitigate the demographic threat, as they put it, that Palestinians pose. For example, a 2003 temporary order passed by the Knesset, renewed every year since, effectively prohibits the granting of permanent residency or, or long-term legal status to Palestinians from the West Bank or the Gaza Strip married to Israeli citizens or residents. And Israeli authorities from former Prime Minister Sharon to current Prime Minister Netanyahu have made clear that this is a policy primarily about controlling demographics inside Israel proper. In addition, Israeli policy across these areas have sought to maximize the land available to Jewish Israelis and confine Palestinians to dense enclaves. Inside Israel proper, the government has adopted what it describes in its own words as a policy to Judaize the Negev and the Galilee, areas that account for two thirds the land inside Israel and the majority of the Palestinian population. These policies are the most stark in the Negev, where the Israeli government has refused to recognize 35 Palestinian Bedouin communities, making their 90,000 residents effectively uh, uh, forced to live illegally in homes that they've lived in you know, for decades. The Israeli government refuses to provide bu building permits, has carried out thousands of demolitions, refuses to connect homes in these areas to electricity and water networks, um, and you know, has made life uh, very difficult for these communities. Inside the municipality of Jerusalem, which includes both occupied East Jerusalem as well as West Jerusalem, the Israeli government's goals set by the municipality for, the, uh, you know, for Jerusalem clearly set out a goal of, quote, maintaining uh, a solid Jewish majority in the city, which it says it will pursue in part by, quote, pursuing densification and thickening of Palestinian neighborhoods. The municipality has even set targeted target demographic ratios that it hopes to maintain between Jewish Israelis and Palestinians. And of course, the policy is most stark in the West Bank, um, you know, where uh, government policies for decades, such as the 1980 Drobel's plans, calls for authorities to, quote, settle the land between um, Arab minority population centers and their surroundings, noting that doing so would, quote, remove any trace of doubt about our intent to control end quote, these areas forever. You know, the massive land grabs and the building and the massive investment infrastructure to connect settlements to Israel proper make clear the intent for permanence. Uh, you know, and Gaza also fits into this analysis. People often, especially with the conflict, think of Gaza purely in, uh, you know, a security lens. However, the reality is, if you look at the statements of Israeli officials, and if you look at the research we conducted, and this is work done by Gisha, by Palestinian human rights defenders, if you look at how Israel's implemented its separation policy, what it terms a separation policy between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, it is clear that Israel is in, in effect uh, withdrew from Gaza in 2005 and pursued a policy since to in effect gerrymander a Jewish majority across Israel and the remainder of the occupied Palestinian territory, using Gaza as in essence a receptacle for taking 2 million Palestinians off the demographic books between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, you know, um, many of the policies documented in this report, whether they be the land grabs, the revocation of residency, et cetera, have no legitimate security justification or use security as a pretext to advance demographic objectives. But even where security is a motivating factor, for example, in the closure of Gaza, the Israeli government has pursued a policy, um, you know, for example, to ban the travel of all people outside narrow humanitarian exemptions um, that goes far beyond what international law offers and no more negates an intent to dominate than the use of indiscriminate uh, discriminate force you know, or torture, which ostensibly are done for security reasons, would justify those serious crimes. These policies amount to a discriminatory intent 
one of the elements of persecution, and an intent to dominate, one of the elements of uh, apartheid. Pursuant to this intent, Israeli authorities have erected a two-tiered system that I described at the beginning um, to maintain uh, you know, this domination. In the OPT, uh, the means used to further that objective amount to systematic oppression, the second prong of apartheid. So the report goes into depth about what so the systematic oppression looks like. It includes in the occupied Palestinian territory in the West Bank, um, subjecting Palestinians for half a century to draconian military law while applying Israeli civil law to settlers living in illegal settlements in the same territory. The application of dual bodies of law, that means that a Jewish Israeli and a Palestinian living in the same territory who commit the same crimes are tried in different courts where they will receive different sentences, of course, more harshly for the Palestinians. In the West Bank, the Israeli government enforces segregation, preventing Palestinians from entering settlements except as laborers bearing special permits. And um, the Israeli government has plundered the land and the resources of Palestinians and allocated that overwhelmingly 99 plus percent where it's gone to third parties to Israeli settlers living in illegal settlements. In East Jerusalem, which Israel considers part of its sovereign territory, even though it's occupied territory under international law, we see similar separate and unequal dynamics when it comes to allocation of resources, similar plunder, uh, you know, of of resources and, you know, for example, the Israeli government has revoked the legal status of nearly 15,000 Palestinians um, from East Jerusalem since 1967. They've granted them a conditional revocable status while Jewish Israelis living in Jerusalem have the security of citizenship and permanent status. Inside the Gaza Strip, the Israeli government has enforced for 14 years a generalized travel ban on the more than 2 million Palestinians in Gaza, robbing them with free exceptions of their free movement, effectively turning the 25 by 7 mile or 40 by 11 kilometer, 30, 365 square kilometer territory into an open air prison. Authorities have also sharply restricted the entry and exit of goods, which has been responsible for severely crippling the economy of Gaza, leading to a reality where 80% of the population relies on uh, humanitarian aid um, and, and, and where access to electricity is significantly reduced, where the majority of families spend the majority of their days without electricity um, and where GDP per capita has decreased um, since the early 1990s. Inside Israel proper, Human Rights Watch also found institutional discrimination that reflects the intent to dominate according along many of the same lines, including um, when it comes to access to land, where you have about 19% of the population of Palestinian citizens who live largely on 3% you know, of the land, where hundreds of small Jewish uh, communities across the country have the power by law to exclude Palestinians from living there. And fifth and, uh, and third and finally, um, amid this context of systematic oppression, Israeli authorities have carried out a range of abuses uh, against Palestinians. In the occupied territory, Human Rights Watch has found five clusters of abuses that amount to inhumane acts, the third and final element of apartheid. Let me sort of, and, and also severe abuses of fundamental rights, the second element and final element of persecution. Let me briefly lay those out. One is the sweeping movement restrictions, the aforementioned closure of Gaza, the imposition of the permit regime in the West Bank, forcing Palestinians to obtain permits, which are almost impossible to get to enter large sections of the West Bank, 600 checkpoints nearly and other closure obstacles spread across the occupied Palestinian territory, which can reduce um, which can turn in, uh, you know, uh, a short drive into an hours long uh, commute. Uh, in addition, uh, you have the separation barrier built largely on Palestinian land. Um, secondly, you have the mass expropriation of land. You know, nearly two, more than two million dunams uh, confiscated from Palestinians, more than one third uh, of the West Bank, reducing Palestinians to living in a series of enclaves. I see my time is limited, so I'll just quickly run through the last three. Coercive policies in Area C in East Jerusalem, which make it effectively impossible for Palestinians to obtain a building permit that have led to thousands of demolitions. Uh, 46 Palestinian communities today at risk of demolition. 
fourth, the stripping of more than half a million Palestinians, um, you know, in the West Bank of their legal status, you know, between 1967 and 1994. And fifth and finally, the mass suspension of civil rights, um, uh, you know, to 4.7 million Palestinians in the West Bank in East Jerusalem, um, denied of rights to free expression, association, assembly, or meaningful say in the affairs that conduct, uh, that affect their daily life. Let me just say, end by saying that based on these findings, which are the most stark that Human Rights Watch has reached in the nearly three decades we've worked on Israel-Palestine, we have a series of strong recommendations. Those recommendations stem from, uh, are consistent with where Human Rights Watch has found crimes against humanity in other contexts. They include recognition of the crime and statements to that effect, a UN commission of inquiry and a global envoy for apartheid and persecution, um, to investigate and prosecute those Israeli officials implicated, both at the International Criminal Court as well as in national courts under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Fourth, targeted sanctions against those Israeli officials implicated. And fifth, conditioning arms sales and military assistance on steps to end the crimes. And sixth, for all countries to evaluate their relationship with Israel uh, to ensure non-complicity in the crime. And I'll end by saying the following, which I think is relevant to where I hope the conversation will go in this segment in terms of where the conversation is going. Um, a 54-year occupation is not temporary. A 30-year stalled peace process will not on its own dismantle systematic repression. Denying millions of Palestinians their fundamental rights solely because they're Palestinian and not Jewish is not simply a matter of abusive occupation. The first step to solving a problem is to diagnose it correctly. Apartheid is no longer a hypothetical or a future scenario. It is the reality for millions of Palestinians. A threshold has been crossed. It may well have been crossed years or decades ago as Professor Falk and Palestinians have been saying, but there can be no doubt that it's been crossed today. And the last line I'll say is that those who strive for Israeli-Palestinian peace, whether a two, a one state solution, a confederation, must recognize the reality today for what it is and bring to bear the sorts of tools that a situation of this gravity warrants. We will continue to see ugly cycles of violence like what we've seen in the last two weeks until we get to the core of the matter. The core of the matter is apartheid and persecution. It must end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. That was certainly very thorough and, and meticulous and eloquent and a fascinating presentation. We will go next to Professor Richard Folk to discuss more in depth both the Human Rights Watch report and the ESCO report, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. Uh, the ESCO report adopts a broader definition of apartheid. Um, the report uh, concludes, quote unquote, that on the basis of scholarly inquiry and overwhelming evidence, Israel is guilty of the crime of apartheid. Uh, professor Richard Folk is, of course, an esteemed and eminent uh, professor emeritus of international law at Princeton University, a former United Nations Special Rapporteur to the Occupied Territories, and uh, the head of our Board of Trustees at Euromed Monitor. Professor Folk, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Mohammed. Uh, it's uh, a privilege to be part of this panel, and I'm delighted that Euromed has uh, convened uh, such a panel. It's uh, a pleasure to have heard uh, such a definitive uh, exposition of the apartheid character of uh, Israel-Palestine that was given by Omar Shaker. It, it uh, really uh, removes any reasonable doubt as to uh, the uh, character of apartheid as applied to uh, at least the river to the sea. But uh, I want to uh, start by emphasizing uh, the core definition of uh, apartheid in the Afrikaans usage, which uh, where the idea originated. And the word means separateness. 
and the, the essence of the way in which uh, Jews uh, dominated uh, the population of uh, historic Palestine was through a politics of separateness. And that's from the very beginning. Uh, and for a long time, and part of the uh, interest in this ki kind of uh, evaluation of the allegation of apartheid is the uh, way in which the narrative of uh, Palestinian grievances and Israeli justifications has shifted over the years. Because the other aspect, the de facto aspect of uh, apartheid as practiced in South Africa, uh, which wasn't is not acknowledged in the word separate development or separateness, uh, is domination, dom uh, a discriminatory domination. And it's, it's that fusion of domination based on race and separateness as the uh, modality of domination that is epitomized uh, by the uh, way in which uh, the Zionist project has been implemented uh, over the decades. And in that sense, uh, in a way you, it, tracing back to the origins of Israel and the ethnic uh, uh, cleansing involved in the uh, Nakba uh, at the very birth of the country, uh, one sees that uh, there was a certain kind of inevitability of uh, an apartheid regime emerging for two reasons that are distinctively uh, Israeli and, and do not follow from uh, the South African experience. The first of, of these reasons is that Israel came with a claim of being a democratic state. See, South Africa never made that pretension and, and the uh, white uh, ruling uh, class was always a minority, small minority, uh, pro uh, probably no more than 25% uh, in South Africa. Uh, but to legitimate Israel and to reflect the ideology of the founders, to maintain a democratic, uh, at least facade, for Israel required a particularly harsh form of repression that included ethnic cleansing from the beginning. And the expulsion, in other words, of the uh, six to 750,000 Palestinians combined with the denial of their right of return was all premised on this uh, necessity to maintain a, democrat, a stable democratic, demographic majority in order to be uh, uh, able to proclaim in their narrative that they were the only democracy of the Middle East, which of course is an absurd claim when you uh, follow the lines of analysis that uh, Omar just uh, laid out for us. Uh, and the, the uh, second element was the historic one, that uh, in order for a demographic majority through immigration to be achieved, involved relying on a colonial pledge in the form of the Balfour Declaration, uh, at the time when colonialism, European colonialism, was collapsing all over the world. So, and, the, and this led the more uh, uh, clear political analysts within the Zionist movement to know that they would be faced with 
intense resistance. So that it was this uh, swimming against the current of history, uh, establishing the only settler colonial state after uh, 1945, when all the major colonial uh, possessions were being challenged effectively uh, by nationalist movements. And I'm, I'm mentioning these uh, elements because they set the stage for the inevitability of an apartheid system. How are you going, how is it possible to impose a Jewish state on a non-Jewish society in a time of decolonization without both uh, extreme demographic manipulation and uh, harsh repression uh, based on race. And so it's, it's that background, I think, that gave rise to allegations of apartheid. And interestingly, within Israel, going back to the time of Ben-Gurion, uh, and up to the uh, leadership of Omer, uh, when Israel, Israeli leaders speak in public, they have often acknowledged, if we can't find a way to make peace with the Palestinians, we're going to end up in an apartheid state. Uh, but if, inter if that is said internationally, as John Dugard and I said in our reports, uh, while we were special rapporteurs at the UN, then it's a, a form of clear anti-Semitism. See, the, the same language in, internally in Hebrew and in, internationally in English has a completely different uh, political uh, significance. So it's, a, it's against that background uh, that Virginia Tilly and I uh, prepared a report, an academic report, which really uh, foreshadows and, and is in considerable detail compared to the Bet Salem report, but not, not so compared to the uh, Human Rights Report, uh, examines the policies and practices of Israel from the perspective of the Palestinian people, rather than from the perspective of the land occupied or controlled by uh, Israel. And that has uh, uh, one extremely significant practical effect of including the refugees and the uh, involuntary exiles. In other words, if you are dealing with people and with uh, the uh, impact, implementation by Israel of the politics of, of fragmentation and separation, uh, it seemed to us artificial to look only at what was happening in the land under uh, Israeli control. And so that's why we conceptualized the inquiry into, uh, in terms of people rather than uh, land. And uh, I welcome what uh, Omar and others have to say about that distinction, which is, I think, very important, not only uh, intellectually, but also in terms of the policy implications of of how you how you circumscribe the crime of apartheid, uh, and and we know from the jurisprudence of apartheid uh, that it's not tied to the South African precedent. That, as uh, Omar uh, explained it uh, in the 1973. Uh, international convention, it is uh, characterized by these uh, three elements. And, and it seems to 
uh, it seemed to us that those three elements are as uh, plausible in relation to people, the Palestinian people, as they are to the Israeli control of a particular area of land. Uh, the, I w the other element that is uh, important to mention, it seems to me, is the uh, uh, 2018 uh, basic law. It passed by Israel, came almost a, about a year after our report, which was released in 2017. And it, without using the word apartheid, really affirmed the, the uh, commitment to Jewish supremacy and to uh, Jews alone having the right of self-determination in territory controlled uh, by Israel. Uh, and and the, the combination of the 2018 basic law and the attack in the UN Security Council on our report uh, gave the issue a much greater uh, a dissemination than it would otherwise have had if it had been a, sort of ignored by the UN and uh, no basic law had been passed uh, in Israel. Uh, so I've often said that Nikki Haley was our best publicity agent uh, by uh, her uh, quite venomous attack, including a personal attack on me, uh, which without obviously having read it and uh, having read the report or understood that it contained, a it was an academic study which had a disclaimer. It wasn't a UN report or not a UN document. And all the Secretary General did was to take it off the, uh, the uh, uh, website of ESQA, which prompted the resignation of the director of uh, ESQA, uh, Rima Kalaf. Uh, uh, let me say in the remaining time, I don't know how much time I have remaining, but- We have two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, let, let me, I don't, I don't mean to not accord uh, attention to the Beth Salem report because it was an extremely important thing for the leading human rights NGO in Israel uh, to have the courage and the uh, intellectual clarity uh, to examine carefully uh, uh, the, the allegation of apartheid and more or less along uh, the lines that Omar uh, delineated uh, came to the conclusion that the overwhelming evidence of, from policies and practices of Israel supported uh, the conclusion that not only in the occupied Palestinian territory, but embracing Israel itself, that it was, in other words, uh, it was a system of control by Jews over non-Jews that was sustained for purposes of maintaining racial supremacy uh, through discriminatory and inhuman uh, uh, means uh, that uh, established uh, the clear finding or supported the clear finding of uh, apartheid. And, and so, one has coupled with the uh, human rights report a, uh, a genuine crossing of the threshold and, and uh, understanding that the threshold is partly the normalization of the discourse, that it now is uh, uh, almost, uh, uh, it is no longer a inflammatory and provocative uh, allegation to use the language of apartheid, 
uh, and so it become and and uh, it is interesting that the critics uh, among liberal Zionists in America haven't really so much uh, challenged uh, Human Rights Watch as engaging in anti-Semitism. They've tried rather to trivialize the whole notion of apartheid as if it doesn't matter. Uh, they can't meet the issue substantively. And so they have to either uh, wound the messenger to destroy the message, or they have to say the message, uh, you can uh, pay attention to it if you wish, but it doesn't much matter. Uh, what uh, We should work for some kind of uh, two-state solution, but uh, it, it, uh, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the way in which uh, Israel maintains its security. And, uh, and so uh, it, it tries to bury uh, the apartheid uh, notion as uh, not touching the core of peacemaking. And I think those uh, our studies certainly, and I think uh, Human Rights Watch's uh, conclusions and recommendations uh, clearly make it a precondition to a sustainable and just peace, that apartheid must be dismantled just as it were, uh, was in South Africa. And I place my hopes, and this is my final thought, on the combination of a further mobilization of global solidarity efforts with Palestinian resistance on the ground as really uh, altering uh, the balance of forces in favor of a Palestinian uh, uh, final uh, po political control of the outcome and the redress of their long neglected grievances. Thank you. Hope I haven't exceeded the time. Thank you so much, Professor Folk, for a very insightful and authoritative, authoritative presentation on both the issue of the ESCO report and the Human Rights report and the Salem report, and of course the, the authoritative and compelling case advanced by Palestinian human rights groups that you and Omar touched on. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Magreda Auken. She's a veteran Danish politician who's been serving in the European Parliament as a member since 2004. She is the vice chair of the delegation for relations with Palestine, a member of Denmark's Socialist People's Party, part of the European Green Party. She is one of the most prominent advocates of the Palestinian cause in the parliament and in the European arena, and has been to the occupied territories multiple times. Her office recently released a report on the issue of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon that, that touched on the topic of the right of return. We turn now to uh, you, uh, Ms. McGrader, to discuss the impact and significance of this shift in the human rights and international community on the issue of apartheid and a right-based approach to the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me here. I'm really honored and I'm also very, uh, you know, uh, 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 pleased or what is the right word to get this report now from Human Rights Watch because it really makes the basic, the solid basis behind things that have been said for a long time. Let me remind you that already in December 2009, the Palestinian churches uh, from, Beth from Bethlehem uh, uh, released a report uh, on the situation, uh, uh, ex uh, explicit calling it apartheid. And this report was endorsed by the South African churches uh, under a, 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 a World Council of Churches. World Council of Churches have been very reluctant to really to endorse the whole thing, but South African churches did it in Easter 2010. And while I'm mentioning this because 
uh, you know, when you're going to the political part of all this here and uh, in order to mobilize uh, political attention, but also to be, people feel safe about how we could work with this here, it is quite helpful that we also tell that in the church community, I'm not talking about uh, the, the right wing, uh, 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 you know, I wouldn't really call them, uh, you, but you know them, who's using uh, the Bible as if it was uh, just a, a Old Testament, as if it was a description of where the Jews could be and like this here. But I think it's helpful that we have this, uh, this groups uh, also included. It was, been, it was difficult to use it up till your report on the, from Human Rights Watch because it was ongoing call for, oh, you are coming with all your allegations, you're coming, that's because you're just, you know, and you know all this here. And in order to mobilize politically, and that is a heavy problem now, we have seen, we have for a long time having heavy evidences. I remember Martin Link and his report when he came a few years ago, uh, ago, also as a rapporteur from the UN uh, uh, on this year, very clear of how uh, the occupation was illegal and uh, according to international law, it was very uh, good and nothing happens. And I think that the, uh, one of the promising way forwards now is uh, to use legal means. And if we have strong legal means in hand, so we can also put pressure of the uh, EU member states saying they are not living up to their own laws. I think even in Germany, that would be quite a strong argument uh, to make them uh, to, to something to happen using this legal means and then call for, uh, uh, yeah, what kind of, uh, if it should be sanctions or if we should uh, uh, do only with the, um, with the, uh, you know, uh, segregation, not segregation, sorry, that's a wrong word in this context here. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, we just really, really uh, keep everything doing, uh, dealing with the occupied territory in Israel outside what we, uh, our relations to Israel. I think that that's not clear for me now. Uh, what is clear for me is that we need all, you know, all these uh, means we have to put that kind of pressure that it makes things happen. I think it was you, Omar, who said that or was it uh, Muhammad who said, we can, we really is uh, at risk that within a few weeks, a month, if uh, the Palestinians now turn quiet again and silent, uh, they will be forgotten. That, that is, was, that is, we have seen it so many times. I have followed this file since 72. That was the first time I went uh, uh, to Israel, Palestine. And we have seen every time they are silent and nice and behave, they're forgotten. And that's a very, very bad lesson to, to teach them. Only when you are out there and uh, using rockets or even, even you know, a, a real uh, a heavy attacks, uh, you're recognized. So how we should mobilize in, in our member states in, within the EU uh, to make them, uh, also they're looking for uh, tools, means they can use because the Israeli uh, uh, you know, uh, embassy in all of our, uh, uh, our member states is really harsh in their, in their uh, not, I wouldn't use such a soft word as lobbying. They are pressing, they are attacking, they are, you know, uh, I haven't seen any other diplomats in the world, and I've seen quite a lot who behave like that. And people are scared. I know that if, if many of my German colleagues, they are clearly scared because they are uh, heavily attacked as they are in, 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 in many other countries, including my own. Uh, you know, my government shouldn't be attacked, my Danish government, but it shouldn't be scared. But it still they respond with such a, oh, don't touch this here because then we are in trouble because we are accused of anti-Semitism. You were talking about, uh, uh, Professor Folke, on, on the uh, uh, trivialization of the human rights, sorry, on the apartheid, I could talk about civilization of the anti-Semitism. Because you, if you are in, insisting of saying that all this critique is against Jews, then you might have the results that some people think it's Jewish to behave like that. And that is not, uh, that's really, I think, one of the risks we are in. Uh, we have been it since, uh, I, from my childhood, I'm very old. I remember this, uh, this uh, 
uh, Jewish societies also in Denmark, accusing everybody who crit uh, had critique of, the, of Israel for being anti-Semitic. And now we have this terrible definition of anti-Semitism, which came a few years ago, and which should be challenged much more than it has been up to now, because it's really used by uh, also people within the European Commission. Uh, you might, might have met Schnurbein, uh, with Schnurbein, she's one of them who's, who, do, who does that. So uh, I won't spend more time if there should be any time for questions here, because I need so much to find a way to act on this here politically, uh, uh, how to, to mobilize. And I'm so grateful we now have your study. You know, uh, you could say that most of what is in it has been known for, for years. It's just only go gone worse. But now you made such a good uh, documentation for those who don't really believe that it is like that. And uh, uh, and then in the end, a little word about uh, apartheid. I don't think we should uh, we shouldn't go for a South African solution because uh, it's there the situation, as you rightly uh, 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 mentioned, uh, Mr. Falk, uh, that uh, the situations are very different, and uh, we could we could make the one state. Of course, we should make in in South Africa. That was the only way out, but in the uh, uh, Israel Palestine, even if segregation, as you uh, told was, and I was very much listening. But I think when we have, uh, look into experiences we have from so many places in the world, I think a, a one state will be a hell. Uh, just look to Yugoslavia, look to other places, even if we provide everybody with equal rights. Uh, and of course, that's the only way that could happen then it will be, you know, I think it will be terrible uh, what, we'll, we'll, what we will see. So we have to find a way to go for, and I won't, I, I never say a two-state, I always say the two-state, the two-state, the one defined uh, from the UN and, uh, uh, and also in their differentiation strategy in these places here. Uh, and I cannot see uh, other, uh, you know, useful solutions. And we have uh, the best part of the, uh, of you know, you had the breaking the silence on this part too. You have some of these people strongly advocating this. And I, I, I need also to have these hooks from the UN and international society when we are working for a, a just and fair peace uh, and, uh, and digni a, 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 a dignified life for Palestinians and a, a freedom. And I'm, yeah, I, I, must, I will end by saying I'm so impressed that they still up, they still keep up hope, even the young people. And I think also we should, but we cannot talk about this here, this again postponement of the elections and so on. I, I think we have some words to, to also to say to the PA, but let's be here because now we are talking about the apartheid part of it. And, uh, and that's why we, I will stop here. But we need to find political ways and there you has a very important role to, uh, to play. Uh, to, to make this here move. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Greta, for a very powerful and, and insightful uh, presentation. We now move to our final speaker, Ahmed Al Nauk, who's currently based in, in the United Kingdom. He is from the Gaza Strip, left very recently for his master's studies in international journalism at Leeds University. Ahmed was the manager of a Gazan team called We Are Not Numbers that highlights stories of individual Palestinians and personalizes the conflict and, and brings to an international audience the impact of, of the everyday suffering on ordinary Palestinians in Gaza. He is currently our advocacy and outreach officer. Please go ahead, Ahmed. Uh, you are muted. Try to unmute yourself. I'm, I'm yes. sorry that. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. go ahead. Thank you. So it is uh, my sincere pleasure to be speaking alongside uh, such a prominent and distinguished human rights advocates. Um, as you know, my name is Ahmed and I work as an advocacy and outreach officer at the Euromed Monitor. But, but today, uh, I'm not speaking in the capacity of a human rights advocate. Although it is my greatest honor, 
uh, I will speak to you uh, in the capacity of uh, that I am a Palestinian citizen who lived and raised up uh, in the Gaza Strip, the hottest spot in the world, and a place that is perceived to be home to one of the most intractable conflicts in modern history. A piece of land where the crimes of uh, humanity and apartheid and persecution are perpetuated, according to Esquaz and the Human Rights recently uh, published reports. Upon uh, the release of uh, the aforementioned report, millions of Palestinians, myself included, rejoiced that finally, and after many decades of oppression and persecution uh, that have been practiced against us, two of the most trusted uh, organizations acknowledged our rights and condemned Israel draconian uh, practices against us. And of course, as a human rights advocate, I was one of the first to read the reports uh, that contained um, the, 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 the content uh, of these reports contained uh, agonizingly, all too familiar uh, to, to me, and to read them was very painful reflection on my, uh, my existence as a Palestinian in Gaza. And here it doesn't matter if you are um, a privileged Palestinian or, or not, because I, uh, I myself consider myself a privileged Palestinian compared to the youth, all youth in, in, in my age. But we all as Palestinians experience the Israel's audience racism, and we all suffered from the same systematic persecution against us. So I was born in 1948, 40, in 1994, and I still have strong memories of my early childhood as a four-year-old child whose father used to work inside Israel as a laborer. And my father and many hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were forced to, to, to work as laborers inside Israel because of the Israeli de development of the Gaza Strip economy, which made it fully independent uh, on Israel. I remember when I was only five years old, my father would go out every day uh, to work at 2 a.m. in the morning. He would go out very early in order to endure the torture of crossing multiple checkpoints and inspections at the Israeli site. And then when he returns in the evening, he would tell us horrible stories of racism that he's been endured. One day when I was only five years old, my father came very late and exhausted uh, at night and he told us, a conversation that he had with his uh, Israeli Jewish boss. So the man told my father, and I quote, God created only Jews at the first before he created animals to serve them. And when the Jews got sick of the disgusted shapes of these animals, they asked God to transform them into human shape. And then here you are looking like us. My father said this story to us, to his children. And I cannot forget uh, th this story. My father, of course, referred to show any, any slight offense at this point, because my father used to work there for 30 years, and he endured numerous human rights violations, went through uh, arbitrary arrests, humiliation, inspection, and faced many death threats, and so much bullying and intimidation. It's only because he was an Anju. Little did I know that this conversation took place in Yaffa, the same city which my father came from, the same city which one of my ancestors was killed uh, during the, the war of 1948. And my mother, of course, came from Beersheba. These two Palestinian cities that were blooming uh, a trade of tourism and, uh, and uh, a trade in, in the Middle East. When I was six years old, the Second Intifada erupted in the first days of my school life. And as a kid, my memories were not merely of classes, lessons, games, or homework, like most of the children around the world were. I remember very vividly the martyrs' funerals every day passing by my school, the protests of the Palestinians against occupation, the Israeli tanks invading the streets, and my neighbors walking on crutches after being shot at by Israel. I remember the sounds of bullet fires, Israeli Apaches bombing and shooting, and I remember Iman Hajjo, one of my neighbors who, who lived in Dir al and she was only six months old, six months old, and Israel killed her, and Muhammad al Dura, another child, was killed in his father's arms. The Intifada ended. It lasted for a few years, but then it ended. But these memories kept hanging in my memory. When the second Intifada ended, and when the Israeli settlements withdrew from Gaza, we, the Palestinians, rejoiced. We thought that this is a victory and it's a step toward a sovereign Palestinian state. 
but we were wrong because after the Palestinian leg legislative election were organized and when Hamas came to power, Israel imposed a tight blockade on Gaza Strip, a collective punishment according to the UN and all the international uh, human rights organization. This is a collective punishment and we have seen that the entire world was, uh, was very silent. A few years later, Israel launched its first significant aggression on the Gaza Strip. I was only 13 at that time. And I remember this day, this day very, very, very vividly. I was uh, in my school waiting for the first class uh, to start when suddenly and out of the blue, I saw many Israeli warplanes and they started targeting all the Palestinian uh, governmental buildings and, uh, and, and police stations. And I was only 13. And at that day, I thought it's a resurrection day. <laughs> when I, re I escaped the school immediately and in the streets, I saw only bodies of Palestinians killed or injured and people rushing them into hospitals. When I, when I arrived home, I heard the, uh, the, uh, the Israeli prime minister, Olmert, bragging about killing more than 340 Palestinians in less than 32 seconds. I still remember these, these moments. That escalation lasted for 21 days and it killed more than 100, uh, 1,200 Palestinians and destroyed thousands of houses, houses of civilians, including my uncle's house. I still remember how his house was burned and, and, and destroyed uh, until now. The UN uh, fact checking, uh, fact finding mission on the Gaza conflict, uh, also known as Goldiston Report accuse Israel of committing war crimes and possibly crimes against the humanity. This escalation ended, but another one erupted in 2012 and another one in 2014. But, the, but in 2014, when the war started, it was different from the other wars because in that war, I lost my brother. And I still remember how, how Israel targeted my brother and many of my friends, and they were all killed in one, in one airstrike. I was uh, 20 years old at that time. Uh, and that was the first time I experienced the loss of uh, a very close family member. It was very hard, but when the war ended, I realized that there were another 2,400 other Palestinians killed and their families grieved for them as much as I did. 11,000 Palestinians were injured and hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were displaced uh, in this war. Homes, school, hospitals, governmental buildings, factories, mosques were all targeted by Israel unjustif uh, unjustifiably and arbitrarily. And again, the UN fact checking on Gaza condemned Israel uh, of war crimes and crimes against the humanity, but no sanctions were introduced. When the war ended, the Euromed Monitor established um, a storytelling project called We Are Not Numbers. And in this project, we wanted to shed and tell uh, human stories behind the numbers in the news and later I became its project manager. And through my work in, uh, in a storytelling project, I collaborated with hundreds of wedding writers in which we wrote uh, and where we, we wrote stories uh, of, of Palestinians who lost loved ones. One of, uh, during one of our missions to document the fishermen's life in, in Gaza Sea, we hoped in one of the fishermen's boats and filmed their trip. But at night, and even before we reached the imposed limitation, uh, then of six nautical miles, we were shocked with the Israeli. Sorry, we were shocked with with the Israeli navy firing at us and shooting at us just because we maybe we we got closer to the six nautical miles. The fishermen on the boat told us that a few uh, weeks earlier, the Israeli navy killed their cousin and confiscated their boat. And until now, until this day, these fishermen did not find their their missed cousin. The war ended, and in, then in, in 2018, the Palestinians in Gaza fed up with the blockade and decided to protest peacefully on the Gaza border in what they called the Great March of Return. As a journalist and a writer, I went there every day to cover the, uh, the events uh, as they take place. And in their protests, I've seen tens of Palestinian peacefully protesters being killed and shot at. I still remember that I saw one of the children who was 11 years old and he was a few hundred meters away from from the fence but Israel shot him in the head and I still remember him 
dying. The UN investigated these two things and it concluded that Israel might have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity in the peaceful protests. But unfortunately, no sanctions were imposed in Israel. The Great March of Return ended, but then Israel was never made accountable for its crimes. But I still continued to work as a human rights defender and a journalist until I won the Chibnik Scholarship to, to study journalism in uh, masters in journalism in the UK. But when the, U uh, when the UK consulate applied for a permit for me uh, on my behalf to travel through Aries, I was the only one who was the only student to be denied permit. And the only reason I can think of for denying me a permit is the same reason why Omar Shaker was denied access to Palestine through human rights work. So, and I wonder if this is not apartheid, then what is that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for a very, very powerful remark on, on the situation and bringing a vivid picture from Gaza and how it is to grow up in, in this conflict as a Palestinian. Um, I will turn now to the discussion segment of, of today's um, webinar. And I will start by posing a number of quick questions to all panelists in, in the discussion. on either Professor Folk or on Human Rights Watch and Omar Shaker. Although, for instance, Human Rights Watch have shown uncompromising determination to criticize both sides of this conflict, including the Palestinian Authority and Hamas for practices of torture, etc. But there are other, um, let's say, talking points or arguments in the pushback against this report or against this growing consensus of apartheid. So one is the issue of legitimizing uh, Israel's actions, not denying them, but legitimizing them under the pretext of security needs. How far do you see security needs in Israel to be legitimate before they encroach on Palestinian uh, Or the use of the term apartheid might be a charged um, concept that delegitimizes Israel's existence or, um, or distorts and defames the Israeli people and um, the Jewish people at large around the world leading to attacks. So for instance, during the last escalation on Gaza, we saw remarkable activism in, in the US Congress by a progressive, a number of progressive Congress people including Alexandria ocasio cortez that said that uh, Israel is an apartheid and apartheid cannot be a democracy. We saw also this sort of uncompromising and, and speak very passionately about it. But recently, Senator Sanders um, opined on the topic and said that we should tune down criticism of Israel to some extent as to not to exacerbate anti-Semitic attacks on Jews, whether in, in, in New York or in London, as we have seen in very highly atrocious and condemnable incidents. So what are your remarks on, on the issue of this delegitimization and the need to tune down criticism of Israel in order not to fuel anti-Semitism? The other question that I have is to put the latest escalation in Gaza in a broader context. So many Palestinians have been pointing out that this escalation might have been triggered by the cycle of this slow, invisible, latent violence that is routinely normalized. It becomes almost invisible in which daily indignation, rage, um, humiliation, oppression, despair, all are combined together to produce uh, cumulative rage uh, and uh, let's say in credence to the idea of armed resistance that could be triggered at any certain point and lead to more and more escalations in the future. And the third question that I have and I conclude with it is the issue that um, uh, uh, Ms. Makeda Aukin pointed out with the one state versus two state solution is um, in the Human Rights Watch report to recommend, for instance, to the Palestinian Liberation Organization, 
that they should embrace a right-based approach to in their advocacy to solve the conflict. Is it possible to build consensus around the idea of the one state is the two state did already, did we cross that bridge with the issue of the EU uh, to, to uh, propose that question to uh, Ms. McGrader again, is when we have, let's say, a paralysis in the EU's um, internal position, uh, ability to develop an internal unified position towards uh, playing a political role in, in advancing a solution to the conflict, what alternatives are there? We have also a question from um, Dominica Al Khodari in the chat box in regards to the growing restrictions on freedom of speech across Europe and in Germany in particular. What is there in our toolbox to push back against this sort of uh, growing restrictions? And we can start with the same order of speakers. So we go with Umar first. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mohammed. Uh, as always, very thorough questions, a lot there, uh, and I, I want to hear from the others. So I'll just maybe tackle a couple of them, and happy to come back if I miss something that you or the panelists asked. I actually want to first uh, go to a point Professor Folk mentioned because it's a really good one uh, regarding the different approaches. I think it actually shows that different organizations and individuals can reach similar conclusions via different approaches and methodologies. I think. You know, Professor Falk's report was so important for so the Esquire report was so important for so many reasons, but I think the fragmentation analysis was really sort of compelling. Um, you know, we took a bit of a different approach, which was um, because we're talking about a crime and we really focused on the elements was really to look at, um, you know, from a, almost the perpetrator angle, right? So like, you know, what are the elements and how does the perpetrator, how is it carried out? But I think it's a complementary analysis to look at it the way um, Professor Falk did. We certainly did not leave refugees out of our analysis. Anyone who's all those who've read the report know that we talk about, um, you know, the denial for Palestinians to uh, who are from Israel, the occupied territory, to return to their homes as reflecting this intent to dominate. And, uh, you know, among the abuses we detail in the report, but we primarily analyze this as examples of discriminatory policies and practices by the Israeli government, uh, as opposed to treating refugees as sort of a separate domain as Professor Falk's analysis does. I don't think either approach, you know, I think they're both different ways of of getting to a similar, um, you know, result. But to your questions, I just want to address that as Professor Falk asked in his remarks. Um, to your questions, I think I addressed a little bit security um, in my remarks, but um, just to add a little bit, which is to say, of course, um, international law provides plenty of latitude to states to take measures with regards to its own security. Um, but what I laid out in my presentation, what we do in the report, um, you know, is the extent to which the abuses at the core of apartheid. Again, you could apartheid could apply to many things, some things, you know, we took a pretty narrow view of apartheid, you know, looking largely at issues of land, legal status, access to resources, right? We didn't focus as much on excessive force or torture or other issues. And for those issues, security for, for the large part is not even a stated motivating factor, right? When you come to like, why does the Israeli government grab land in the West Bank? Why does it, you know, um, discriminatorily deny permits in East Jerusalem? Why does it deny residency rights to Palestinians in Osmanian and Gaza? Security was almost never the motivating factor. When it is, like the closure of Gaza or the denial of civil rights, the report shows the way in which the Israeli government has gone beyond what international law op authorizes. And having a motivation to ensure security is not a carte blanche to do whatever it takes, right? You can't indiscriminately use force. You can't torture, right? By the same token, you can't practice apartheid to ensure security. It's not a legitimate means uh, uh, to do so, but, but, and it doesn't negate the intent, right? You know, just because security was a part of the motivating factor, if you pursue security by domination, you can have an intent to dominate as well, right? Um, so, you know, and of course, there are examples where Israel, you know, has acted um, you know, in response to real security threats, right? So I think we can't paint with one brush, but I think the report is really nuanced in describing where security is not a motivating factor, where it is a motivating factor, but Israel goes beyond the law. And it doesn't talk about other policies, you know, which, which may or may not be legal. In terms of the question about, um, you know, anti-Semitism and delegitimizing de Israel, let's just say it is, I think, appalling um, that anybody, you know, would use this report to further their own anti-Semitism, period. 
I mean, it goes against everything the report is about. The report is about, uh, you know, ensuring, uh, you know, everybody has equal rights. Um, and so the idea that anybody would use this to further anti-Semitism is just uh, is, is galling, right? And, and, and this is not unique to Israel-Palestine, by the way. You know, we've seen examples where we issue reports, for example, about child marriage in countries where people use that for Islamophobia, right? It's appalling that anybody would use documentation of human rights abuses, you know, by a government to fuel their hatred of another people. That's against the principles that human rights stands for. And we actually wrote a piece at Human Rights Watch uh, about this kind of wave of anti-Semitism um, and, 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 and making clear that, you know, these acts, um, you know, to accuse the, to, to, to have views and to carry out acts against Jewish people for the actions of the Israeli government is abhorrent. Um, and there, there's, there should be no equivocating about that. Um, so, um, you know, but, but let's be clear here, right, that when it comes to delegitimizing Israel, um, that's not what this report does. So this report is about delegitimizing Israel's practice of apartheid. Uh, and just as we, you know, we found apartheid, by the way, carried out by the Rohin against the Rohingya uh, in 2020, that no more delegitimizes the, the state of Burma or Myanmar than this report does here. You can document, speak out against, we do it in 100 countries across the world. We're not delegitimizing those countries, we're delegitimizing, um, human rights abuses by those countries. And those abuses should be. And in this case, we're delegitimizing the system of oppression that that country carries out. But the report's also very clear that there's no international law bar, you know, for example, to the Israeli state prioritizing Jewish immigration. You know, there's also no bar, you know, for, for a state to proclaim whatever identity it wants. But that's not a license to systematically discriminate against another people. Uh, you know, you, you can't use that as a basis to deny people their rights, including their right to return to a country that they're from. So I think, you know, um, if anything is delegitimizing Israel, it is its practice of apartheid. And that's why the government should end it. That's the problem, not pointing out that apartheid is the reality. I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just a fact. And so, you know, pointing it out is not the problem. The problem is the practice. I'll stop there because I'm very eager to hear what the others have to say. Yes, thank you so much for a very compelling answer. We move to Professor Folk now on the same issues. Uh, good. And um, uh, let me just, uh, Omar ended in a, such an interesting way that uh, it prompts me to ask what amounts to a question to him, which is, um, is it plausible to think that Israel can survive as a Jewish state without apartheid? See, the, uh, my feeling is that, that it's, it's uh, raison d'etre of being both democratic and Jewish in a essentially uh, non-Jewish society with a long history uh, creates an impossi impossible uh, solution along the terms of affirming equality of rights. It, it, it doesn't seem to me that that can be plausibly implemented. And in that way, I see that the whole uh, project of establishing uh, a Jewish state and a non-Jewish society uh, had this fundamental flaw from the beginning and led to ethnic cleansing at the outset, which was a massive violation of human rights. But without it, how could uh, Israel have maintained the claim, uh, the credible claim of being democratic? Uh, and subsequently, in this period of anti-colonialism, how could it manage to establish uh, security against uh, Palestinian resistance of a nationalist sort? It is their country. That, um, at least there's a strong sentiment that, that their country was made a Jewish sanctuary by uh, European uh, acts for which Palestinians had no responsibility. And, and uh, 
And it, uh, I also think uh, that in relation to uh, our Danish colleague, that the whole future, the peace of the, uh, of the two peoples depends not on the UN, but on the self, their self-determination. That's the most inalienable right. It's the not, Article One of both human rights uh, covenants. And uh, the UN itself never consulted the people of Palestine when it imposed this partition solution. Can you imagine Denmark being very happy with the UN deciding that it should be divided between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Swedes and uh, Denmark, Danish uh, people because of some historical claim? Uh, <clears throat> uh, no solution looks possible now. You, it, the two-state solution is seem absurdly blocked by settlements, the settlements and over 500,000, uh, uh, many of whom are extremist uh, ideologues and have shown that uh, in recent weeks where they uh, went through, uh, marched through, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Palestinian territory uh, neighborhoods in Jerusalem chanting death to the Arabs. Uh, the, the, uh, this notion that you can ha somehow have a, uh, get them to leave what they believe is their promised land uh, seems to me to be politically naive. Now, let me very quickly say something about the uh, uh, questions that were put to us. Um, and I think that the uh, that Israel itself has uh, confused the issue of anti-Semitism by trying to create, treat criticism of its policies, even of the international court, criminal court's recent decision on uh, uh, investigating Israeli crimes, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's initial reaction is, this is pure anti-Semitism, uh, which is an attempt to say, uh, he doesn't want to say, he can't say convincingly that the decision was uh, distorted or uh, legally uh, uh, refutable. And so again, this is an example. You you uh, uh, delegitimize or you uh, attack the institution rather than what the institution did, rather than the judgment. And this has generally been the uh, uh, side effect of this irresponsible playing of the anti-Semitic card for political purposes. It fuels genuine anti-Semitism. Uh, it, it, it actually contributes to the thing that it denounces. And the incidents, for instance, which uh, reveal a hatred of Jews, not a criticism of the Israeli state. That's what anti-Semitism is about. And uh, Jews of all people should protect that uh, definition, and they shouldn't allow it to be uh, used for opportunistic political uh, debate, which is what's happened in recent years and has been uh, latched onto by uh, right-wing politicians in Europe and uh, the US. Uh, the, the final point is, the security point, and uh, Israel's security has been uh, less and less directly at stake. For instance, in this last surge of violence, the 11-day 
a tank. There's great suspicion in Israel, including by a large number of Jews, that Netanyahu provoked the rockets in order to strengthen his own weakened internal political position. And uh, part of what happened is what I call the politics of decontextualization. In other words, one only talked about the rockets and the retaliation and Israel's so-called right to defend itself. And one forgot about the evictions from uh, Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, the demonstrations of the right-wing settlers that were very inflammatory uh, in, in uh, Palestinian neighborhoods. And the most uh, provocative of all was in the, in the last days of Ramadan to send security people into the Al-Aqsa compound and the mosque uh, and disrupting uh, Muslim worship during a period, a sacred period. Uh, and, and to expect uh, Hamas and Palestinians to accept that kind of behavior without responding. And they have no alternative ways of responding other than to fire these indiscriminate rockets that do one, I think, uh, one thirtieth of the, cause one thirtieth of the fatalities of the response that uh, Israel has made. So the security argument has to be deconstructed and contextualized to make any sort of sense of it. Let me stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Folk. We will go back to Omar very briefly to respond back to your question. Thank you. Uh, Professor Volk, it's a fascinating question. I think one that you and I could probably talk about for many hours, and I want to hear from the others. But just to say, you know, uh, apartheid was not inevitable, right? Uh, if you think about this, and this is not Human Rights Watch, you know, we don't, we're, we don't do historical analysis or even sort of academic studies. And, you know, we study facts and apply the law, right? But just to say, you know, um, Israel, when it was established in 1948, could have pursued many different policies. It could have pursued, you know, a policy. And of course, there are elements of some of these things that others would find, but it could have, you know, apartheid is one tool. It could have pursued a policy of pure genocide, killing everybody that was living there that was Palestinian. It could have pursued a you know, which is you know, obviously an extreme version of genocide, but it could have pursued a policy of, um, it's not a legal term, but a full out ethnic cleansing, removing every Palestinian who lives uh, on the ground, expelling them you know, from, from the territory. It could have pursued a strategy of uh, apartheid. It could have pursued a strategy of full equality, uh, you know, maybe with integration, maybe in a forcible way, uh, you know, the extreme version being what's happening with the Uyghurs in China, which Human Rights Watch has called also crimes against humanity, um, there could have been full equality, there could have been, you know, uh, full separation. I mean, you could imagine any number of other scenarios. So I don't think apartheid was inevitable. Um, I think there could have been other courses. And indeed, some of these other policies, there may have been elements or parts or even fully at different points historically, but certainly um, the finding that Human Rights Watch um, has reached today is one of apartheid, uh, you know, and, and persecution. Is it possible that there's a Jewish state here? I think that's, it's a hypothetical and one that I don't think we're well placed to answer. I mean, what we, you know, our assessment is based on the facts today. Those facts, if they were to change in the future, we would assess anew. And I, I, I wouldn't be in a position to, I think, speculate about whether or not the elements, the three elements would be there, but certainly one of them is an intent to dominate. And I think that would be um, you know, that would be something you would look at, you know, if, if you have a Jewish state where there's another population, um, you know, how do you preserve that, you know, uh, without domination? It's hard to imagine, I agree with you, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't make a determination one way or, that, with, or the other without knowing the facts. Thank you so much. We go to uh, Ms. McGrady and thank you so much for your patience. We have a number of questions directly yes. to you, all of them about restrictions in Europe and what Europe can do. Thank you. Yeah, well, I have to leave quite soon. So just uh, uh, to, to uh, sum up, I would just, uh, when I talked about the two-state, 
I'm not talking about how, the, how it looks now. Remember, bulldozers can be used for good purposes too. And if we tell the Palestinians that they're only getting the remnants, I once exploded in the face of Ocha when I saw them just presenting the situation as if it was what we could offer as a state. And of course, it's not the case. Uh, and uh, if we really, what has happened in other places is, this is how it is. And you can remove even uh, fanatics, just remove soldiers and police and weapons, then you should see they should run away as soon as they could. And we saw it in other places. And we'll also say that I, I, I do agree with, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Falk on this, uh, that 47 uh, uh, separation was really a, a weird thing to do against another people. And nobody can really be surprised that, that, that it was met with with yes, yes, you, they, they call it war, and I do understand exactly as you describe. It happens to us. I think we would be furious. But uh, where we are since then, I think you have had a, a long range of UN uh, 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 count, uh, conclusions and so on, which still are, are used. They cannot be used if they're not taken serious from the international society. But we have seen many other places in the world where they have been taken serious, as mentioned uh, also from, I think from you, what has happened other places or from Sona that was Oma. And, uh, and that is the tool we have. If that, that the legal mean we have enhanced now is to insist also that we support the ICC and go to our member states to, to, to ask them to do that. And I was asked, what do we do if we cannot get a unified uh, EU response, which I think will be very difficult looking into Hungary and looking into how they behave, uh, even at least not a strong one. And there I, th I think we should go for, sorry, coalition of the willing, sorry for the language, and uh, put pressure on our uh, member states in Europe, using national parliaments, using the uh, public opinion, which is quite strong on, uh, uh, in, in favor of giving uh, 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 justice to the Palestinians and uh, move then. And when we have the legal framework as we have now, and so well documented in this human rights report, uh, 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 human rights, human rights, what's wrong, sorry, uh, report, and then say, well, now you should, you are forced to do this in order to live up to your own legal structure and your own country. I wouldn't say we would succeed because without political will, and that's, uh, that's what we really miss here. But uh, to mobilize the political will, we have all these uh, resolutions and so on and so forth in hands and uh, can use them and should use them to, to uh, force this here. And then I think that we should do everything we can to build trust between the two people. And there I'm really scared because what I've heard also from, I thought, reasonable uh, uh, Jewish inhabitants in Western Jerusalem having a language as if they were, yeah, as, as a bad language, as I've heard from the settlers, the violent settlers. And I think that there's a big, big uh, uh, work to be done from, uh, yeah, schools, uh, uh, religious societies, everybody to, to, to change this here. But I also think there's a will because many, many Israelis get crazy of being uh, living in this country where they are talking security and we are surrounded and everybody's against us and we will be, you know, you get crazy. And living as an occupant is also to, to make people crazy. And that's why so many Israelis have left Israel uh, because they couldn't stand living in these uh, harsh circumstances. So my, so my recommendation will still be use this legal means, but use them in all the political frameworks you can. And there, I think member states for the moment uh, 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 national uh, par parliaments, national governments, and we have also uh, many good people in the European Parliament, and we can do this here, and then we might even make uh, Borel act. He is not a task, and if you're sorry for my language here too, but uh, I think that if he got, if things are moving there, and we can do it also as member states, because we still don't have a formally EU foreign affairs politics. That's, that has to be born in, my, in, mind, born in mind the whole time. And that's why it's still so much depend on the member states. I so much regret that, but that's how the fact is. But we have so many 
legal basis in EU, EU and in member states, and we should use it much stronger than we have done up to now. And these tools are quite strong if they are said, and that's why I'm so grateful for this report now, because it really makes it this it a strong, the strong basis for what has been said, as I mentioned from the Kairos document and so on. It's been said not only for people who have seen terrible facts on the ground, but also have done quite a good quite good analysis up to now. But we still need this push and we need it quite quickly. Uh, I am I'm so scared that things will go wrong again. And then you and then I'm let me finish here. You also need to address uh, the PA in order to give hope to the young people in Palestine. I'm so frustrated that we still haven't moved anything. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Palestine's friends should also be those who tell them the truth about. They are, yes, they are victims, they are occupied, but they still have a responsibility for their people. And uh, that should be said all around from all of us because we are their friends. Thank you. And I have to leave now. Yeah, that was a very thorough answer. And of course, if you have other commitments, that's understandable. We have a number of questions from the audience and uh, we'll go back to Professor Folk again because some of them are about the International Criminal Court and your assessment of that. But first with Ahmed, he's been very patiently waiting for his turn. We have an additional question that reads from Sammy, have you ever traveled to the West Bank in your lifetime, aside from when you left for your scholarship? And Ahmed, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you for the question. This is a very important question, by the way. In fact, I never went to the West Bank and uh, I've never been to Jerusalem. As I said, Israel denied me the permit to go to the West Bank or to Jerusalem. So I had never the chance to go to, to, to the West Bank or Jerusalem. And this is the case for many, <clears throat> more than 95% of the Palestinian youth at my age. We have never been allowed to go to the West Bank or Jerusalem because although it is the West Bank is part of our country, but we, are but we can't go without having a permit from the Israeli army or, or the Israeli authorities that usually, like most of the time, 99% of the time, rejects the, these permits. And this is part of the policy of the systematic policy of the, of, uh, the Israeli occupation. It always tries to separate the Palestinians from other Palestinians, separate the Palestinians in Gaza from Palestinians in the West Bank, from the Palestinians in Jerusalem, from the Palestinians uh, inside Palestine 48, from Palestinians in Lebanon and, 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 and Syria. It's funny that the first time I ever met a Palestinian from the West Bank was actually in the UK. And the first time I ever met a Palestinian from Jerusalem was in the UK. And so, uh, well, uh, for uh, Palestinians in Lebanon, refugees in Lebanon and in Syria. Israel maintains to isolate the Palestinians from each other. It wants to break the Palestinians from each other and make uh, the, the Palestinian suffering uh, for uh, different from Gaza to the West Bank to, to other cities uh, and, and even the diaspora. So I've never been to, to, to the West Bank as many. Um, I'll hold the I'll hold you there person. for a second, Omar. <laughs> He needs to leave for other commitments. So a final conclusion from Omar, and then we we'll go back to Ahmed. And, and very sorry for the interruption. No, just just to say thank you. Uh, you know, to to Yuramed again for organizing. Sorry, I have to leave uh, a little bit early, but um, no, I just I think in, I think the you know listening to everybody here and listening to Ahmed's really powerful account and just imagining what folks in Gaza have gone through. I think it's a reminder to this crowd. And I think I echo you know, what my colleagues have said that I think it's important that we keep the attention, you know, you know, on these issues and that we, we reframe the, the kind of current reality. This is not a ceasefire for Palestinians who live the, re, the daily violence of apartheid, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, for millions of Palestinians on an everyday basis. So I think it's an imperative that we, uh, you know, sort of build on the momentum because it's one thing to shift the conversation. I think it has shifted and there's an opportunity. And I think it's there, we're right talking about the International Criminal Court and the, but we're still, I think, realistically uh, a ways away from states um, moving really in a principled way for accountability. It's good that there's been some momentum and it just makes it more, more urgent, I think, to continue to push this analysis forward. So just to say thanks to all for this conversation and, and to Professor Falk and Ahmed and, and uh, you know, and to so many others, uh, you know, who have, who have continued to uh, push forward this work where we're at Human Rights Watch. Um, happy to add, add our voices. Of course, others have been saying this for a while and we hope that 
others will speak out, will find the courage to find apartheid, and that ultimately this uh, shift can lead to um, better protections and stop the kind of bloodshed we've seen in recent days. So again, apologies for leaving early, but look forward to uh, continuing the conversation in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you so much, Umar. And, and Professor Folk, if you can wait with us five more minutes, there are there's a number of questions about the ICC, but first we have to go back to Ahmed and then back to you for your assessment. Thank you so much. So Ahmed, your thoughts on, on the other issues of the Gaza escalation, what can be done, the one state, two state, or the issue of delegitimization of security needs. Thank you. So the question for me? Yes. Yeah, so regarding the one state or two state solution, unfortunately and painfully, the Palestinians have long agreed to any possible just solution for the Palestinians. Right now, if you are asking about my, my personal opinion, I would go for uh, the one state solution. But for Israel, the one state solution is uh, an existential threat because as we have seen from the previous reports, one, uh, one state solution means demographic uh, uh, privilege for the Palestinians and Israel will never allow the Palestinians to be more than the Israelis. So for, for Israel, this is uh, an impossible solution. But for us, and for me as Ahmed, I think this is uh, the most m moral and just solution. But the Palestinians, the PA agreed to the two-state solution, and even Hamas that Israel considers, considers a terrorist state agreed to the two-state solution in which the Palestinians have their own uh, government country in, in the borders of 1967. The problem is not with the Palestinians or what they propose for solutions. The problem is with an Israeli uh, authoritarian regime that is built on apartheid and racist against the Palestinian people. The problem is not with us and whatever we, we ask for, the problem is with Israel and with the Western uh, countries that uh, support Israel with, with, whatever Israel, with whatever Israel needs. Uh, so uh, as Ahmad, I would agree for to say solution or what's the solution or any solution that would guarantee the Palestinians their, their rights, uh, all of their rights, including the right of return and um, and the end of the occupation and the end of the um, racist apartheid uh, regime uh, that Israel perpetuate against the Palestinians. Thank you so much, Ahmed. So back to Professor Folk, we have the issue of legal tools. We had a number of questions about if the ICC investigation can be a deterrent to Israeli violations or push forward the, a solution to the conflict. We have the issue of the one state solution. And we have the remark from Magdal Aukin about the conflict or the occupation driving Israelis crazy, or to put it in other words, that occupation is corrupting the souls of Israelis or the oppressors as much as it's ruining the lives of the oppressed. So if you can please touch on, on these issues and provide your assistance. Uh, yes, those are uh, important questions. And I want to start by uh, thanking Ahmed for uh, giving us this concrete experience, which really makes the policies and practices of apartheid tangible in the lives of the Palestinian people. And that's a very powerful dimension that is often uh, overlooked in uh, these kinds of discussions. So we owe a big debt of gratitude for your participation. Uh, the ICC uh, decision for, of the uh, uh, chamber, what they call the preliminary judicial chamber, uh, was a big symbolic victory uh, for uh, the Palestinian people because of its um, lending credibility to the allegate, fundamental allegations that Palestinians have been victimized by serious patterns of criminalization uh, in the period covered by the ICC investigation, which is uh, after the uh, PA joined, on joined the uh, court on behalf of Palestine became a party. Uh, there's a, a, obviously a lot of geopolitical pushback against the decision uh, by the US and Israel, and including some important European countries like Germany and the UK. There's a new prosecutor 
uh, about to assume responsibility for going forward with this uh, decision. So we don't know what will happen, and we do know uh, with a with some with a confidence approaching certainty that the Israelis will not cooperate with the prosecutor and that the Palestinian Authority ha is constrained in uh, cooperating with the court by uh, some interpretations of the Oslo uh, interim agreements. Uh, and that will be a, a legal issue down the road. My own feeling is that it will be very difficult to uh, use this decision as a way of actually holding individuals accountable for their crimes. But one shouldn't underestimate the symbolic uh, contributions that result from a finding of this sort. And one should remember that in conflicts of this sort, the side that wins the legitimacy war usually controls the political outcome, although a lot of time may elapse and a lot of suffering may occur. If you look at all the anti-colonial wars since 1945, they have been won by the militarily weaker side, the, the, the side that has less success on the battlefield and combat zones. And that's because the forces of nationalist resistance and global solidarity with that nationalist uh, impulse of peoples became very strong in this historical period. So I have confidence that the Palestinians, by winning the legitimacy war, which this apartheid discussion is part of, will also win the political uh, struggle for their basic rights. Let me stop there. Yes, and I can add that you mentioned in uh, in the ESCO report on apartheid that it would take an international tribunal to make this authoritative. I will come back to you again, Professor Folk, for concluding remarks, whether we cross the threshold for making the issue of apartheid authoritative enough or of, or if more work needs to be done. But we go to Ahmed for his concluding remarks first. And thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much, Muhammad, And thank you so much, Professor uh, Richard Polk. Um, your words mean a lot to me and uh, your work for the Palestinian people um, has been, uh, been a great and much uh, and highly appreciated. Uh, I would like to say that we, the Palestinian people, we cannot win uh, this war alone. If we do not receive support from the international community, the Palestinians alone are too weak to, uh, to overcome all of these um, atrocities committed against the Palestinian people, uh, for most the, the, the apartheid that's practiced against us. Uh, during the past week, we have seen lots of international support from the public. And that was um, a great step in the right direction. I think if we, uh, I think we need more and more support from the international community, from the governments, from the public opinion. Uh, we need more protests that demand the rights for the Palestinian people. If we do not see this kind of support, I don't think that the Palestinians will be um, liberated soon. I don't think an end for, I don't think uh, an end for the apartheid uh, for the apartheid regime uh, of Israel w will be soon. So um, thank you again for, for having me and thank you, Dr. Richard, for your amazing remarks. Um, and we need more support from the international community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. And uh, Professor Richard, if you have concluding remarks to end the discussion with, thank you. Uh, well, let me just say uh, it's been a very... Um, stimulating and uh, valuable uh, discussion that recognizes both the achievements of the recent past uh, and the importance of these apartheid uh, reports 
and the changes in the uh, international discourse and public opinion. And, and at the same time, I agree with Ahmed that um, this alone will not be enough. Uh, and it's extremely important for uh, the peoples around the world to put pressure on their governments to take stronger stands in the UN and elsewhere uh, to make, uh, to exert pressure on uh, Israel of the sort that will create more space, more political space for finally coming to a, a, a sustainable accommodation. And I do find the South African precedent instructive for how its apartheid regime was finally uh, ended without uh, armed struggle, without uh, significant armed struggle. And it really represented this uh, resistance uh, on the ground, uh, making the country difficult to govern, combined with a very uh, resolute uh, inter global solidarity campaign, which included the BDS initiatives. And in one way, the, the change of heart of the uh, ruling uh, white elite was more surprising in South Africa than it would be in Israel, where the population uh, are demographically pretty balanced. Uh, the whites in South Africa took the chance that uh, a constitutional uh, uh, democracy would, would certainly put the Africans in power. And after all the abuses and atrocities they'd suffered, they might have expected uh, severe retribution. And so it, there, it looks very unlikely that uh, the Israeli leadership can be persuaded to uh, change their view of how to relate to the Palestinians. But this demonstration of Palestinian samud and capacity to maintain their struggle against overwhelming odds with a greater show of global solidarity can produce results that now seem impossible. So I believe it's a time when we should assume responsibility for doing all we can, because I don't think governments or even the UN will be uh, motivated sufficiently to change the uh, basic relationship. But I think if people mobilized and exert enough pressure on their governments, and of course the key government is is my own, the U.S. And it's not; it's already changing. the The uh, uh, public opinion uh, is more receptive to the Palestinian narrative than it ever before has been in my lifetime. So I think it's not a time to be discouraged, but it is a time to intensify our efforts on behalf of the Palestinian uh, search for basic rights and for a, uh, a, a political solution that brings uh, justice and a solution that recognizes the right of self-determination. Thank you so much. That's a very powerful note to end on in terms of, of international solidarity with Palestinian actions. We've seen an, an overwhelming and increasing growing number of supporters during the last escalation. And as you and other panelists touched on that it's very important to keep the Palestinian narrative alive in times of quiet, not just in times of escalation, and to build on, on this solidarity that's growing and, and uh, revived after the last uh, round of atrocities. 
Thank you so much, Professor Folk, Ahmed, and uh, Omar, and uh, my Fayda Alkan for your patience and powerful remarks and thoughtful presentations on the topic. And thanks to our audience for, for their patience with this discussion and very important uh, uh, webinar today. You will find the recording of the webinar on our Facebook page. And thank you so much for your time. And everyone have a great day after this and looking forward to seeing in touch. Thanks. Thank you, Mohammed, for very good moderation and so, my pleasure.